Ja, einen wunderschönen guten Tag. Ja, herzlich willkommen zu Tag 4 auf der X-Sign-Bühne, unserem letzten Live-Talk hier. Der Talk wird in Englisch sein, darum äh, wechsle ich jetzt auch mal auf Englisch. So, uh, good afternoon everybody. Welcome to day 4 of the Remote Chaos Experience, uh, our last Live-Talk here on our X-Sign-Stage, um, which is, as our, was the talk about self-driving cars yesterday, a production we do for the Munich channel. I, kind of forgot to mention that yesterday. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Munich, for choosing nice talks, and uh, we are happy to produce them. And uh, yeah, today our guest is Dr. Kira Finke. Uh, she is from the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, and she is going to tell us a little bit about Corona and the climate crisis, and is going to compare those uh, emergencies. And uh, yeah, without further ado, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Felix, and it's a pleasure to be here and talk to you today about the parallels of the corona pandemic and the climate crisis. This talk builds upon a research paper that we released um, over the summer and um, it will follow its structure more or less. At the end, we'll have time for discussion. So um, let me just start by giving you a quick uh, run through what I will go through. Uh, we structured our talk into several sections um, called diagnosis, prognosis, therapy, rehabilitation, and of course, the, the conclusion. And on the right hand side, you can see the paper. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, institutional defi deficits surfaced. Uh, one could see there was a lack of preparedness, um, risks that could have been averted uh, when were not. And um, there are significant parallels between this global health emergency and the climate emergency, which have become apparent over the past years. Um, the questions that arose were, how can global society manage the shared risks and avert emergencies? And what can we learn for emergency prevention and management? So what is an emergency? This is the first thing we started out with. And we rely upon a paper that was published um, before this on, on the climate emergency. And here already the parallels unfold. Um, it is called the emergency formula. And it basically uh, defines emergency as risk multiplied by urgency. But what is risk? Um, risk is the probability times the damage, and the urgency is the reaction time over the intervention time. So here um, you can see a picture of uh, what is supposed to be the Titanic and the iceberg. And this is exactly the situation that, um, that uh, provides a metaphor for what an emergency is. As I said before, uh, emergency is identified by uh, risk times ur urgency, um, which is the probability times damage for multiplied by reaction time over intervention time. And I will go more into detail of what this means in terms of uh, the climate crisis and the corona crisis. Basically, what is important to realize that is that if um, reaction time and intervention time converge, so the time to avoid damages, uh, and uh, the time um, that is available to do so, um, we have lost control. So it's very important to, to avoid this. Um, and we will go uh, structure the talk uh, with this emergency formula. So let's first look at the diagnosis, um, which is providing scientific understanding. Um, if we do a risk assessment um, of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 and climate change, um, there are several factors that you need to look at. For example, in the case of COVID-19, um, the, the contagiousness, uh, the duration of infections, uh, the transmission pathways, the mortality, which groups are more at risk and why, um, what are the options available for therapy. This, of course, changed uh, throughout the duration of the pandemic. Um, how is immunity structured? Does it, um, are you immune after reinfection? So on and so forth. In the case of climate change, um, of course, uh, one very important variable are uh, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, um, but also how the climate system reacts to it. So what is the climate sensitivity here? Then temperature rise, the resulting climate impacts, sea level rise, extreme events such as tropical cyclones, uh, floods and droughts, etc. And also our adaptive capacity, how, how we are able to respond and adapt to these, these different changes. So 
this risk assessment, this diagnosis, is the basis for all further steps that we're looking at. Um, one example here in, um, that became quite clear early on in the COVID-19 pandemic um, is the case fatality rate of COVID-19. This is um, basically, um, this graph is basically showing you that um, the older the age groups are, um, the higher the mortality rate is. So um, this means that elderly people are much more likely to develop severe symptoms and are also much more likely to uh, die from those symptoms than younger people. In, um, in the case of climate change, the projections are also quite clear. Here you can see two different graphs um, on uh, climate change uh, projections. So on the left-hand side, you can see um, how um, greenhouse gas emissions would drive uh, temperature change over time. So you can see the change um, until 2100, 2100. And you can see um, that it strongly depends on the emissions pathway we take. So the blue, um, um, the blue areas that you see here is the pathway um, that would be in line with the Paris Agreement that would uh, require rapid emissions reductions. And the red pathway is what would happen if uh, we do not uh, stop uh, growing the emissions and would lead us to what we call a business as usual scenario, which could lead to four degrees plus by the end of the century. On the right hand side, um, you see um, the um, so-called burning amber graphic, also from the IPCC, where you can see the different levels of risks associated with different temperature levels um, um, on, on the right hand side. So, for example, unique and threatened systems such as coral reef systems are already under pressure right now as we are um, around above one, one degree Celsius um, above uh, industrial levels of uh, average temperature. So when you look at um, pandemics, when you look at climate change, in the case of Germany, um, these threats to global security are already mentioned in certain documents. So you can see it here in the guidelines on civilian crisis prevention um, and also in the white book of the German military, the German Bundeswehr. Um, I posted two quotes for you here. Um, for example, health risks can have destabilizing effects on whole regions and can undo long-standing development gains. So these aspects are mentioned, uh, climate impacts and pandemics are mentioned as challenges for German security, um, but there's no concrete strategy of what to do. Um, with this risk. So looking at um, the next step, the prognosis, we can see here um, how we define urgency again. So urgency is a reaction time over intervention time and intervention time is a time span from the point that a risk is identified to the point of impact. Reaction time is a time span needed to change course and avoid impact. And the reaction time depends both on hard factors, so what type of infrastructure you have um, or what type of technology you have, and also on soft factors such as information networks, political leadership and willingness to act. So it's not only, um, only the system that defines um, how we are able to react, but also um, the choices by society and political leaders. So again, urgent action is required if the risk of damage is high, and the reaction time and intervention time converge. So um, we know that uh, control is lost if the reaction time is longer than the intervention time available. Then basically um, the impacts cannot be avoided any longer. Um, when we look at the urgency in the case of SARS-CoV-2, uh, the coronavirus um, that has caused the, the pandemic over the past year, there are critical time points after which a certain level of damage can no longer be avoided. Um, and um, these critical time spans um, encompass, for example, national outbreaks, so it could have been contained locally or, um, um, or to certain regions within one state, um, it could have been that uh, an, a, a pandemic could have been avoided uh, and just limited to an endemic um, so that uh, the virus would not have spread beyond China. Um, and another critical time span is that the number of intensive care patients 
um, is uh, not larger than the number of uh, intensive care beds. Um, even small delays in testing and tracing can have large and deadly consequences. So this uh, means that even if um, you then invest in adaptation, meaning you start buying intensive care units, um, ventilators, um, trained staff, etc., if you are already on this exponential curve, this will not suffice to prevent the damage which you could have prevented if you had started to, um, to act earlier. And a similar um, situation on a much larger scale we are facing with the climate crisis. Um, we know for intervention time that at the current levels of um, CO2 emissions, the carbon budget, so the amount of CO2 that we can still release into the atmosphere, um, will be exceeded in less than eight years under um, the current uh, emissions pathway. Um, and this would mean that, as I showed earlier, um, some graphs that uh, certain risks would materialize. For example, um, tipping elements could occur in the Earth system as early as 1.5 degrees. Um, and um, this could mean that there's potential points of no return after which these, um, these risks and these changes can no longer be undone. Um, the reaction time herein is the decarbonization of the global economy. So if you imagine that um, we have to go to net zero emissions globally, this requires also time to do so. Uh, we cannot just simply switch from one day to another. It needs time to decarbonize energy system, to build new structures, um, to, for example, um, change the way we practice agriculture, the way we construct buildings, etc. All of this requires certain times until um, we have both the technology available, but also um, the system infrastructure um, available to us so that we can uh, transform all of, all of this. And um, yeah, the control is lost when the time left for intervention to avoid harm is smaller than the time needed for reaction. So this is the point at which the Titanic sunk. Um, then uh, um, at a, even though the, the iceberg was visible relatively early on, there were only a few seconds in which um, the captain could have turned the ship and avoided the impact. After that, it was no, no longer possible and the fate was sealed, basically. So what you here see is um, that um, tipping points in the Earth system can start as early as around 1.5 uh, degrees for, for some systems. And um, the tipping elements are connected um, potentially in, in somewhat of a domino effect, meaning that um, they um, can start influencing each other. When one system uh, tips, it affects um, the tipping probability of the others. So, for example, one element here is the Amazon rainforest. Um, it can tip, change its... Uh, um, change its uh, character from a tropical rainforest to more of a savanna type of forest um, when the temperatures rise above four degrees or when deforestation reaches a quarter of the of the forest cover. So this is uh, very worrisome because right now deforestation rates are very high and also um, warming is is increasing. So this tipping point is approaching sooner than is comfortable for our risk assessment. Um, what is the role of science in this prognosis? So what is interesting um, about um, the role of science in here is that we learned in the corona pandemic that science can help us to understand risk before they arrive at our doorsteps, so before we can see the effects of, of these risks. So long before the impact occurs, um, we can, through science, for example, through epidemiological models, through climate models anticipate the risk and therefore act very early on and um, so to say increase our perceived intervention time. So we need to assess the risk, what is the probability and what type of damages could they, could occur and what is the urgency, what is the intervention time, what are critical points that we really need to avoid um, and what is the reaction time, when and how can we still intervene. Um, and we, we know for both uh, corona and the climate that cascading impacts could overwhelm our capacity. Um, in the case of corona, of course, this mostly refers to our health system's capacity. And we know that immediate action is, is required to avoid damages such as deaths. 
And what is uh, the therapy? Um, our headline for the therapy is avoiding the unmanageable and managing the unavoidable. So the unmanageable in this case is a health system overload or collapse because of uh, extreme demand for intensive care. And in climate change, it would be more than two degrees global warming. Um, and to avoid really this tipping cascade and potential ecosystem collapses that would follow. This would require mitigation and prevention of infections in the case of COVID and mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions in the case of climate change. The unavoidable um, is in the case of COVID-19 disease outbreaks and deaths from infections that have already occurred um, and in climate change warming and impacts from already released greenhouse gas emissions, which we are already witnessing today. Uh, and throughout this entire year, it has become abundantly clear that wildfires are destroying habitats of both humans and animals. And the unavoidable requires us also to invest into adaptation um, so that we can limit the experience of damages that are occurring. Yeah, what can we learn from the pandemic? It is that people can and are willing to change their behavior if they perceive uh, a crisis and that the sum of many individual actions matter. So it does matter um, if I, uh, the way I behave personally, it does matter and it can change the course of a global and national crisis. So this insight is very, very important for, for both crises actually. But it also um, requires strategic and coordinated action. So um, we need this um, government regulations in order to coordinate our collective action um, that rests on individual efforts. So these are all insights that are, in, in that sense, encouraging, um, in the sense that we are able to cope and uh, to overcome uh, very complex crises. Um, and when we look at uh, how to transition to carbon neutrality and how to reach climate stability, um, we can look at two approaches. One is a bottom-up approach, people changing the habits, and one is this coordinated top-down um, approach where we redefine how we want to govern global commons. And um, one important insight is this uh, solidarity that this is based on. Um, for the climate crisis, it is clear that we need to change the course of global emissions. Here you can see the so-called carbon staircase um, upon which a paper was built um, that shows that um, there are several steps that are required in the next decades in order to um, reach net zero emissions by the middle of the century worldwide. And um, there are several low-hanging fruits that could be tackled very early on. But for this, um, we need uh, rehabilitation. Uh, we need healing of body and soul across the generations because um, it is um, a really uh, interesting situation that in the COVID-19 pandemic, um, the elderly generations are much more at risk than the younger generations. I remind you of the slide that I had shown earlier where you see the case fatality rate going up as, you, as the age increases. Uh, whereas in the climate crisis, the younger generations are the most affected because in their future lie the, the heap of uh, the mass of climate impacts. So um, it is important to, to unite uh, behind the science and to um, have a, yeah, a kind of constellation of actors that seeks to protect the weakest. And this has worked to some degree, at least, and uh, in different constellations. In the case of the COVID-19 pandemic, the different actors who were less affected by the pandemic uh, moved to protect um, the elderly generations. And in the case of the uh, climate crisis, we need the same thing. We need a coalition of actors who is willing to um, change course in order to protect the youth. And um, this is an ethical dilemma, of course, of weighing economic, cultural and societal sacrifices against the direct protection of lives from the infection or against severe future climate risk unfolding only in maybe decades, although we can obviously see already uh, very severe climate impacts emerge. So one key ingredient for this is intergenerational justice. And um, we demand in this, um, in this paper a so-called climate and corona contract where young generations would pledge to protect the elderly and other at-risk groups by adhering to infection protection measures 
as has been the case over the past year, um, most young people have adhered to, um, to the infection uh, protection measures, although they themselves were not at high risk. And at the same time, older generations uh, would uphold and strengthen commitments on climate protection, such as the Paris Agreement, such as the European Green Deal, to protect the future of the youth. At the end, I would like to uh, remind you um, that already all future crises um, will happen against the background against of, uh, of the climate crisis. So we have seen, for example, in the case of the corona pandemic, that island nations like Vanuatu had to battle on two fronts, basically, um, trying to uphold infection protection measures while also being extremely affected by tropical cyclones. Um, and in other cases, this was also the case, like with droughts, with floods, uh, with heat waves. Um, it's very difficult to address multiple crises, which is why we need to address the climate crisis urgently. Um, the conclusion here is it's time to act. Um, and the different variables of the emergency formula can be influenced by mitigation, which lowers the probability for damage to occur at the beginning, adaptation, limiting the experience of adverse effects of damages, governance, to be able to uh, efficiently use our reaction time, and science, which can increase the human perception of the remaining intervention time. So based on this, um, going back through to our emergency formula, um, we have built a kind of contingency plan because we know some damages can no longer be avoided, um, both for climate change and the corona pandemic. But there are certain things that we can do to limit the damages and limit the experience of the damages. With this, I look forward to our discussion and I close the talk. Thank you very much. There are already some questions in the pad. Uh, if the audience wants to add more questions, uh, now is the time for that. Um, the first question is, what do we know about people or groups spreading misinformation to make climate change and the pandemic worse? Is there evidence for my impression that they are mostly the same for both topics? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, for the case of climate change, uh, it has been proven many a time that there are companies, uh, especially fossil fuel companies, other lobbyist groups who are investing in spreading and the spread of misinformation, basically. So, um, and this is often very well done. Um, it's uh, concealed behind very fancy looking graphics and for the layperson, very difficult to distinguish what is um, information provided by scientists and what is information provided by somebody who can make nice graphs, basically. So um, this, is, this is a very um, crucial element why action has been delayed over decades. I mean, a, a lot of this knowledge about climate change um, was already available decades ago. We knew about the risk, now we even know more about the risks, yet people are hesitant to act. And um, the spread of misinformation for the COVID-19 pandemic also goes into this direction of science denial, basically. And um, I think it comes from the same sort of mindset, uh, sometimes not from exactly the same sources, uh, exactly, but um, one element is, of course, the... Um, uh, the availability or non-availability of reliable news formats. So um, in Germany, um, we have news formats that are trusted by the public, um, that everybody can, can rely on in order to receive information. Um, but this kind of um, publicly funded news is not available in every country. And um, this has led to um, news channels being more or less on one political spectrum or the other and has led to the politicization of issues like climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which is very prob problematic because um, um, it's, it's fine to have an opinion about which policies should be made, but the facts uh, should be the same in our discussion, even if we have different opinions about the policies and such. And I see here also a lot of danger in the spread of misinformation over uh, social media networks. Um, from which a lot of people are now relying on uh, for their news source. So this is also problematic because there's no real fact-checking going on there. Thank you for that answer. Um, the second question would be, 
Given that our CO2 budget will be used up within eight years, while mainstream politics reject the very concept of a CO2 budget, and fossil lobby groups seem to be as influential as ever, do you think that we already crossed the point of losing control? Um, I mean, um, it's it's difficult to say. Um, for once, there's still a lot that we can save by our actions. So I, I personally have a lot of hope that um, the transformation will be more rapid than what, from what we can foresee from this current standpoint. Um, and there's still a lot that a lot of systems that uh, are stable for a, a lot more time, a lot more emissions. So it's very important that we keep those safe. However, we have already lost a lot as well. So it's really, it really depends on your standpoint. So if you live on the Marshall Islands in the Central Pacific, which are two meters above sea level, yeah, it's, it's, we're at a very critical point. And also if you're in Bangladesh, if your child has died from a tropical cyclone that would have normally not occurred in that strength, the point of no return has been crossed for that child, right? So it's, it's very, um, it's very dependent on your on your standpoint. Here in Germany, here in Europe, we have the money to fortify our housing, etc. Um, we can we can adapt to some degree of climate change. We're also not as exposed as other countries because of our geography. But um, uh, it's important to emphasize that it's worth the fight um, to to limit emissions now. And I also see some positive indication that this is now being taken more more seriously. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, all the good things are three. So our third question, um, especially if I see the the picture in your slide there, uh, do you think that um, the Corona pandemic uh, made the climate change? Uh, ignorance worse in the last year so that uh, it, it was more in the background and uh, people are thinking about like more threatening problems uh, because that's they happen faster than climate change i don't think so i think it has still um it has still been in the media still i'm able to talk here to you there's still people who are interested in this um so i think it was not completely forgotten but of course uh, the urgency of the corona pandemic demanded the attention of policymakers, etc. So um, I, I, it is my hope that through the the experience of the adverse effects, um, also in industrialized countries of this pandemic, we realized that we are not exempt in Germany or in Europe or in the United States or wherever from global shocks. It matters to us. Uh, if there's a wildlife trade in China, it, it, we have to be concerned about, it, as should be the people in Bangladesh should be concerned about coal mines in Brandenburg. So I think this recognition that we are connected and we can lose control, even in modern societies, uh, like in Italy, for example, capacities of the health system were overwhelmed. So even then, um, I think it, we have come to the realization that we are actually fragile and we need to take risk assessment seriously and not just rely on our good fortune. Okay, thank you very much for the answer. And uh, ah, there's another uh, question. If we see Corona as the speed run, can we learn something from our response to the pandemic for our response to climate change? I didn't hear the first word. If we see Corona as the speed run. So like uh, that was the, the, the fast we uh, uh, react to a worldwide crisis. Mm -hmm. um, what can we learn from our uh, response to the pandemic for the fight against climate change? Yeah, yeah, the speed run. Sorry, I didn't catch it the first time. Um, yeah, I think it, it shows that if we intervene early enough, we really have a chance to avoid later damages. So we really need to use these scientific um, means of risk anticipation in order to um, to avoid exponentially rising damages so i think this is this is one very heavy realization and the second is and i, I mentioned this in the talk is that everything we do matters it's not that we're just uh, helpless in the situation but everybody can do something and does contribute to a larger thing so in the case of COVID-19, it's whether I will have a party with 10 people or not. 
um, whether I will choose to uh, meet several friends after another or not. In the case of climate change, it does matter if you are taking the flights, if you are voting for a Green Party or for, for a party that doesn't take anything seriously. So these individual decisions uh, accumulate to something bigger and they can change the course of a global and uh, national crisis. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any more questions. So thank you for your talk and uh, hope to see you soon. Thank you as well.